Okay. Welcome, um, everybody. This is the permaculture um, talk with Ezio, my husband. And um, it's for the permaculture dancing dragons to inspire you all with permaculture knowledge. So um, Ezio is a, um, he's, he's a project manager, but he manages his projects with a lot of permaculture input. And he's inspired me for a very, very long time. So um, I'm very happy to share him with all of you and um, for him to tell you his permaculture journey and how he incorporates permaculture into his everyday life. <laughs> So, um, welcome Ezio to our, to our Permaculture Dra Dancing Dragons Permaculture talk show. <laughs> we are very happy for you to be here. And um, now you may introduce yourself. <laughs> uh, thanks Dee, and thank you everyone else who's uh, joined in. So Denise just threw me in the deep end and just said that uh, teach <laughs> permaculture, you know, so she usually shoots from the hip. Uh. And so I'm used to taking these, these shots from all angles. And um, so I've put together a couple of um, slides that I hope try and explain what permaculture is all about, including the design process. Now, needless to say, if you want to find out more, you know, the best way is to actually go and empower yourself um, go and do a permaculture course and so forth. But we'll talk more about that. Uh, towards the end of the course, at the end of the slideshow rather. From Bill Mollison, he's one of the co-founders um, back in the late 70s. He was an Australian guy and him and his uh, top student, um, Dave Holmgren, they coined the term permaculture, which means a permanent uh, culture, a permanent form of agriculture. So if it's permanent, it has to be sustainable. So the first book they, produced, they prepared was uh, Introduction to Permaculture. And, and then they expanded that because they realized that a sustainable agrarian economy, which is the base economy, you have the foundations for sustainable human settlements. So that's when Permaculture 2 came out. And then Permaculture Designer's Manual, this is what Bill Mollison put together. This is kind of the bio of Permaculture. No one else has ever emulated in digital form and whatever. But I really like this definition of, um, of Permaculture. Permaculture, Permaculture, Permanent agriculture is a conscious design and maintenance of agriculturally productive ecosystems, which have the diversity of natural ecosystems. So in other words, it's mimicking what we find in nature. So it's the harmonious integration of landscape and people providing their food, energy, shell sustainable way. Without permanent agriculture, there's no possibility of a stable social order. So there's the classic uh, definition. But over time, what's happened is that many people have taught permaculture and there's different nuances in, insofar as how this um, subject is taught. And just recently, I started realizing that maybe we can streamline um, the permaculture knowledge field out there. So what I came up with, um, and I'm busy discussing this uh, concept with a couple of uh, permaculture people that I know. It's um, a body of knowledge. So as soon as you have a body of knowledge that's formalized, and there's the definition of, from Wikipedia, it's kind of um, an acknowledged form of um, a particular field. So for example, project management has got a project management body of knowledge so anyone who wants to go and study project management, they would look at PMBOK and that's what, what they go and learn. The same thing with engineers, with uh, most of the medical sciences and so forth. Permaculture does not have a body of knowledge. So here's an opportunity for creating one. So just imagine an egg. This is the best way of concept I've come up to try and explain it in very simple terms. So the egg is the be all and end all, the start of, of life 
it's the form of seeds and so forth. So imagine the seed being influenced by teaching methodologies and the right mindset of the teacher who wants to empower his students with uh, not only reading out of a book, but making things as exciting as possible in the manner that it's taught. And then the student learning activities, making the hands, they learn with all their feelings and, and so forth. Now, what do we teach? So the first thing to teach is the design strategies. And, um, and then the design approaches, how do we, where do we draw our inspiration from that we can apply these strategies? And then lastly is the design processes. So imagine being a doctor and you've got your doctor's bag with all your, your stethoscope and your needles and all sorts of stuff. That's pretty much your design strategies. That's a toolkit, but not as a doctor to heal people. And similarly, if you're a, teach, a doctor teaching um, young in medical interns, you will want to make sure that they have enough practice and diagnostic skills and so forth. Very similar to this permaculture body of knowledge. So if you're a doctor and you've got your toolkit and you go and visit a patient at their house, um, you've got your tricks of the trade, you've got a experience field, which is your design approach. How would you approach a particular um, illness? And then there's a process. So the process is how would you diagnose uh, or start to diagnose a particular patient? Very similar to permaculture. So I think we are almost ready in the permaculture environment to formalize a body of knowledge that would really put permaculture on the map at a professional status. Because what it starts doing then, is it starts standardizing the, the design principles, the, the processes, the approaches, all the educational curricula, its professional standards and so forth. Now the next slide just unpacks it in a bit more detail. You can see here's a structure of it. We've got the teaching methods. So it's the alignment with the sustainable development goals, it's empowering change agents, and it's invoking participatory learning processes. On the student side though, we teaching um, practical experience, best practice, uh, drawing from best practices. Students learn how to design in groups, and so they learn how to agree on how to disagree. They also do individual designs, and all this proves that they can apply this knowledge field that's called permaculture. And they go about it by learning all the design strategies, which is the ethics, the attitudes, and the design principles of permaculture. The design approaches, these are all the, the myriad of fields, the wide subject field that covers permaculture. So we draw in from all the examples that are out there. And the process is what are the stages in which we design something? Now, I'm going to hone in on the design process. So it gives you an idea of a typical permaculture design journey that you would take if you had to design your garden and your homestead or even a larger project like an eco-village. So this is the um, design process I've come up with after many years of designing. And my background is actually as a project manager in the development field. So I've taken the project management cycle from the built environment and knocked it into the permaculture sense. And this is what I've come up with. So when you start a project, you would want to analyze a site. So you can see the image there is typically, there's your site. It doesn't necessarily have to be a circle, but it's just a concept. What is influencing that site? So you would pick up um, all your, your maps with contours. You would map all the building structures, all the services coming into the site, the roads, the traffic, and then also the biological health of the site. And then what's very important, you start doing a sector analysis. And we'll unpack that in, in an example shortly. But at the end of your stage one, 
you've pretty much got a base plan. From the base plan, you can now start doodling your design. So you start doing a concept design. So you can see again your site, your round site, uh, and all the wild ideas that are influencing your design. So you have to start thinking strategically. What is your long-term vision? And then what triggers the design, the magic in the design? You know, what is the, the catalyst which starts putting pen onto paper? If you can imagine Bernardo da Vinci painting Mona Lisa, how, where did he start? How did he start? Why did he start there? So we have that same approach with permaculture and we start applying ourselves just basic common sense. We start looking at the climate, the geography, we see where the water flows, road access and footpaths, looking at um, forestry, forest belts to create windbreaks, where do the buildings go, where do we, we put boundaries and fences, and then how can we fix up the soils, how can we integrate the economy and energy, and then that starts giving us the framework for our design. We then start looking at uh, biomimicry and looking at natural energy flows, even geomancy, and, and then wild design. Wild design is your creative spirit that comes in with, it might be a wild, wacky idea, but why not? If we can make it unique and, and make your, your design stand out, then we can do that. But at this stage, what you're producing is called a concept plan. Concept because you still need to go out on the ground and test it. So sometimes you may want to um, see where you've designed things. Instead of starting the design and implementing it, mark it out on site. Put a row of rocks or uh, some string or ticker tape. Mark out where you want your key features and look at it for a while and think about it and think, you know, this is what I'm going to be putting up with for the next 20, 30 years. Do I like it? Because he has a chance to tweak it. And this is when we start moving into the next stage, which is your detail design. So here you take your, your concept and you start tweaking it. You start refining it and you start packing in a bit more detail. Once you're confident that that is the design, you have a detail design as an output. Now you're ready for implementation. Now you need to plan in detail um, who's going to do what, where, where are your plants going to come from? What is the budget? Um, you need to measure everything, count everything up, and then who's going to help you um, get quotations in? And yeah, manage the implementation side. So that's not the end of the next lifespan of the project. Uh, you will be forever maintaining it. So this is what um, I'm suggesting as a uh, sort of a design uh, process. It makes a lot of sense, especially the concept design where you use um, these triggers, as I was saying, the, what's called a scale of permanence. Um, looking at climate, geography, the things that are most permanent or the most difficult to change. But as they get less permanent, like your energy, your economy, and your soils, they become more flexible. Anyway, let's look at a couple of examples to show you how this is applied, because a lot of this is very theoretical. So we're going to look at three examples. Um, my mom's permaculture garden, so that is a, at a small garden scale. Uh, the next example is at a homestead level, we're looking at an ecotourism project for a family here in Italy. And the third project is the Honeyville Eco Village and Nature Reserve. So you can see how the scale of the permaculture design canvas is stretched incredibly wider. That's not just a simple garden design. You can extend the permaculture principle over a wide nature of projects. Okay, so let's look at my mom's permaculture garden. So when she started, she wanted to dig up the grass in, in her garden. And I said to her, you know, she was going to break her back just thinking about that. So I explained to her that something that could kill the grass very quickly without using poisons is sheet mulching. You basically cover it with cardboard, 
and mulch. And she didn't want to do this for a long, long time because she said it looks very untidy, and it does. But she put up with it, and you can see the, the, the image there. The mulch is a little bit too thin, but that's all she could manage. And eventually she realized the benefits of it. What was happening was that the sunlight was not going through to the grass. Um, when it was raining and when she was watering the, the, the mulch on top, it was um, dampening out the, um, the grass that was dying off underneath. As the grass was dying, it was creating humus. So before you knew it, the weeds were suppressed and she had very good topsoil to start planting a garden. And within six months, she had this fantastic uh, garden. And then it took me a couple of years to get her to put a, a hedgerow around the garden because she was devastated here by the coastal winds, being at Namkamas on the south coast, the blustering northeaster and southwester, they really blow dry the soil here. So I encouraged her to set up a microclimate. And in order to do that, I suggested to her, plant vetiver grass around the edges. And she took one look at vetiver grass and she said, no, it looks too, too rough. It is just too untidy. But eventually I convinced her and she maintained it. It was like military precision. It was cut all exactly the same height. It looked like a parade ground uh, um, company that was at attention every morning. But anyway, as she cut it, as it grew, that became the mulch material. And it also, she noticed the, the vibrancy inside the garden as a result of this fence, just this bit of a fence. It created a microclimate where the moisture was retained, uh, the, the plants weren't getting blow dried by the, by the wind and they had this microclimate to protect them. So in the top photo, there is the inside of the garden, a diversity of, of everything and the vetiver grass around the edges. And then you can see the, just the layout of, of everything, the cabbages with the flowers, the whole garden was a work of art. Um, and eventually even the vetiver grass became a, a work of art. And very few weeds because um, the soil had pretty much um, stabilized itself, even though it was um, quite sandy. Um, but anyway, she, this garden fed her and us for a, for a long time. Eh? So now we're going to look at, I need to stop sharing and um, share the next example. Okay. Can you all see this next example? Dee, can you see this next example? Yes. yes. I can see it. Okay. All right. So this next example is um, this ecotourism project in for the family Cook. It's an English family from Amkamas. They've got uh, Italian connections, and we met up with them last year. Um, let's just see how this design transpired. Eh? So. We arrived in the northeast of Italy. This is what we would do as a stage one of the design, which is your base map. So in stage one, we get the author photo. This is all from the internet, from Google Earth. Um, there's a way that you can pick out contours um, from the internet. There are cer certain um, contour producing um, applications, but it's generally very, very flat. So here is this canal um, that irrigates a lot around here. So the homestead is sitting here on quite a, a large piece of land on a, next to a gravel road, and it's surrounded by vineyards. Now, the first thing that you would do here is um, obviously sit down with the family, um, draw all this information from them, and then do what's called a sector analysis. Now, in the sector analysis, um, we start thinking, where is the view shed? So you can see the, this green color 
the view shed is in the north here because you can see the Alps in the north. So this is the best view site that needs to be protected. Then we've got the agricultural pollutants. This is the, the purple. So all this spraying of vineyards with um, pesticides and all sorts of stuff. Um, the wind drift, you can see it comes from all around them. So there's the purple designation. Then the next part of the sector analysis is the cold winter wind and rains. So that's the this dark blue. So the, the heavy rains here and cold weather comes from the uh, the steppes of um, um, across Russia. That's where the and, and Eastern Europe, those cold winds blow right through into Italy here. So this is where most of the cold climate comes from. It's, it's the, the northeast and easterly winds. Then we've got hot, dry summer winds, this um, light beige from the south and the southwest. We have stormwater inundation. This is the light blue. Now there's a canal right around the site. So when it rains too much, that canal is pretty full. And um, if it drains too much, then the bottom site part of the, of the site here can get a bit um, inundated. Then we have wildlife and animals. So this canal here with all its uh, um, reeds and, and wildlife is a, is a haven for, for wildlife. So if you're growing anything in this site here, they're going to come across from this um, riparian area alongside the river and into your property. So this is the wildlife um, approaches. And then there's also dust pollution alongside this gravel road here. So you can see the, the dust pollution, this uh, light brown color. So that's your typical sector analysis. It's very important to do this because you would need to design um, on how to mitigate these potential threats from the sector analysis. Now, the next slide, we're going to do the concept design. Oh, sorry, the last thing here is uh, looking at the midwinter sun, all the sun angles, and the midsummer sun. You can see it's quite a, a big difference. So, to harness the, the midwinter sun and its shadows, you need to, to pick up this data. Right, now we're doing the design. So, this design, I did at a concept stage. And I would need to go back to this particular family and help refine it with them. But I try to convey to them that the important thing of any permaculture project is to have at least three separate income streams. They might be interrelated, which is fine, but at least bring in three forms of income because that gives you resilience. Having a monoculture product and only income from one source, you're very vulnerable. Two income streams, mm, a lot better, but three, it's like a three-legged bar stool. You've got a lot more confidence and stability. So this family wants to set up this um, little homestead as a potential agribusiness. And, uh, uh, and the, so the idea there is to produce enough food, eco-produce, from the vegetable garden, um, and a seedling nursery, maybe keep honey. They, of course, they've got a, a large woodlot here and um, it's actually a, a little bit of a forest. And then they want uh, this ecotourism. They want to set up a little restaurant, uh, an Airbnb, and one of their sons is very keen to set up a local brewery. So that's the artisanal brewery. And then what about having a third income stream? They're very keen to... to um, empower anyone else to come through here and start running educational courses like permaculture or um, uh, seedling courses or uh, brewery courses, anything that, that's uh, eco-education related. So in other words, using the space here for eco-education. Now look how integrated they are. The eco-produce from the garden not only feeds a family, but it can feed the restaurant and the Airbnb. As visitors come, they become aware of the eco attributes of the site and they will, will be keen to come back and learn more about it so they can apply it in their own um, backyards. 
So we start running learning uh, training courses. They can also start doing eco consulting and hosting volunteers. So this is a kind of a, a very powerful three streamed um, income generating model. Now, how do we make this work um, on the ground? So I need to unpack this, uh, this next image because this next image here is, is the design. <laughs> So if you can just bear with me. So remember the threats from the, the pesticides and everything from the surrounding fields. So the best thing to do is to plant maybe bamboo, a bamboo thicket around the edges. Uh, bamboo loves water and, uh, or any other similar type of uh, hedgerow that can stop this inundation from, from pesticides and, and wind drift. And there's a canal all the way around. So there's no problem growing bamboo all the way around. And that will act as a, also a very good windbreak. Then we also need to thicken these trees uh, as you approach the entrance of the, the site. And the wind thick enough along this uh, road, so along this part of the fence line here this little forest here was pretty thick anyway. So there's not too much dust in at this side. Most of the dust is around the house side. Now there's a slight little downhill here. So why not collect any stormwater that's coming down the driveway and create a, an important feature. This is part of wild design. And the water that's draining out of the fountain in next to the house here is just drifting out into the the ditches um, on the edges of the property. So why not dig it out and create a little pond and put two little islands there? So you've got your predator-proof islands where you would almost definitely attract um, nesting birds that they would be safe there from predators because they would be on on this little island. Then. The vegetable beds would be alongside the house here, this light green. These are the raised beds and also a polytunnel or two. And then this first part of the forest is actually thin it out and create a, a little orchard in there. So this becomes the food forest. And as you cut and mulch and maintain it, a lot of that woody stuff goes into making compost as you shred it. So all these brown things are compost that go into the garden. So you can see how easily accessible everything is here. And then the, the natural forest here, this would be retained, maybe with um, honey production. And then there's this open field here, which one can convert into a camping site using a park and stay for overnight guests, and maybe putting a few compost toilets around there and having this kind of, um, I don't know if you've heard of the glamping experience. Glamping is when you, you literally go out and you, you camp in nature. You provide very rudimentary facilities. But this could be a kind of a glam, glamping um, uh, camping site. Then closer to home here around the building is instead of using the buildings, the, the rooms inside the house for a restaurant, why not create a deck just outside the, the house. And part of the deck would overlook the, the pond. The deck would obviously be, be, have a tarpaulin over it uh, for winter. And then in summer, you could uh, take the, top, the tarpaulin off or it would basically be a pergola. So this would be the little uh, restaurant here. Um, and that's basically the design there. There's also an old stable here. And as I said, we can also put up a, a, nurse, a nursery here for the seedling production and then a polytunnel for the, um, the winter vegetables. But this is basically a concept design. Now, in order to take this to the next level, one would have to consult with this family, make sure they buy into it, that they understand it, and, um, and then tweak the design. You know, maybe set out the pond and they would dwell on it. And uh, if they like it, we could go ahead and actually dig it out and, and construct it. And so this is a, a nice example. I hope that one day they will actually activate this uh, property. It's got 
a lot of potential and um, we would like, to, if we're still in the area, we'd, we'd love to be part of this project. And um, the last slide that I want to show you is part of this project. This, this is something that we would work with this particular family. Um, we've given them an example of a strategic framework. So the strategic framework would have a goal to establish a thriving ecotourism project that promotes sustainable living. Their values, we would have to tease out with them, but we could influence them with the permaculture ethics as very good values, earth care, people care, and fair share. The overarching objectives, these are the three-pronged economic income streams. Um, so those are already stated. And then the critical success factors, you can see here it's all blank, together with the action plans and the key performance indicator. Because as I said, this we would sit down with a family and help to draw it up. But the first block here could, could be, for example, setting up the, um, the boundary fence, you know, planting the bamboo and protecting the site. And it would have certain action plans. Another critical success factor could be the vegetable production um, garden. The next one could be the um, food forest. The next one could be the creation, the establishment of the restaurant. Um, the next one could be digging out the pond and setting up the garden immediately around it and so forth. So one can craft a strategic framework in this manner where you could go ahead with any of these um, action plans uh, separately or in parallel, but this would also inform your your program and your timeline. And you would go about this depending on the number of resources and support that you would have. So this is the example of um, a homestead. And now we're gonna look at uh, the example of an eco village. So I wanna do a new share here. Okay, so this is Honeyville in um, the Eastern Cape. It's just inland from Jeffreys Bay, Hulmansdorp, on the inland side of the N2, about 10 to 12 kilometers. And John and Caro, they're the farm owners here, and they've basically converted this entire farm. You can just see the yellow boundary. If you see where my, the mouse is moving, this. This is the boundary of, of Honeyville. And they've got development approval where they've converted Honeyville into a conservation area. Um, but they've retained the agricultural, the arable land, which is this light green. And also they've got permission to set up, um, I think it's about 35 odd um, homesteads. And uh, I met John many years ago and he asked me, you know, can you come up with a concept design for what we're doing here? So I, I, I supported him with it. And then a few months later, we did a permaculture design course on the farm and we got the students to actually deepen this design that we had conceptualized. And we came up with some really good student designs that uh, gave us lots of food for thought. But let's see how we, um, approached the design of this eco-village. So th the design approach here was pretty much based on um, just getting the basics right, is looking at rainwater harvesting and, and making sure that the framework for the eco-village would be, would be appropriate. So this just zooms in into the development areas and um, because the the whole farm is basically a conservation area now with small small pockets of of development so this is one pocket of development and um, these lines in the background in gray are the contour lines and the blue is the a little um, river that runs through the the site so the slopes are this way across from southwest to the northeast. Pretty gently sloping, but there's a need to harvest rainwater here. And as soon as you have a dwelling 
next to a water body or a dam, it adds significant value. Not only from the value side, but we need water for irrigating the fields and so forth. Because the fields at the moment, um, they haven't been farmed for probably 20 years. So the idea here is on a contour to create a swale and then have these little catchment dams um, that would fill up with water. As the water runs off the slope, it would get caught in the swale, fill up in the dams, and then from here we could irrigate uh, these fields. You see the light blue? Those would be the irrigation lines from this uh, catchment dam. Now remember behind the site here is this huge mountain, um, and that's where all the rainwater comes from. The water falls on the mountain, it runs off, and the idea is to catch it in these swales. Then just above that, we would have the homesteads. So you can see here, these circles would be the positioning of the homesteads, and they would be screened from each other with uh, an indigenous uh, forest belt or maybe even a food forest. So that's the, the dark area is a food forest and indigenous forest. So that's the one area. Okay. This is another area northeast across to the southwest. You can see the, the river running down the middle. Um, so again here we've got these blue lines or the swales that would collect the runoff into the dam and then from there we would gravity feed down into um, the other homesteads and, and so forth. So this is the positioning of the homesteads in this area. These top three sites would have a view uh, of this water body, this dam, whereas these lower three, four sites would be overlooking um, this nice little um, riparian and river, river area. Um, this is the area around the existing homestead. So the idea here is to create tiny homes um, that are form part of the self. Um, Perhaps the, the day visitors or the week-long visitors, they would come and stay here in these little chalets. The idea here on the river is to create a, a weir, so at least we could trap quite a bit of water. The overflow would, fit, would uh, irrigate this arable land here. And then further upstream, we would also siphon water off, create a, a, um, a swale have a ramp up, a ramp up water up for every one meter that it um, that the water flows uh, downhill you can it can pump 10 meters uphill so this is how we could get water up to all these uh, little shallows from here so a lot of the design is based on rainwater harvesting because there's no municipal supply here and, and making sure that there's enough water for the arable land um, and this is just the legend um, for this design. Are you still all with me? Um, at this stage, this is the new share. Um, so those were the three designs that um, um, I've shared, looking at a small garden, um, a homestead, and an eco-village. Um, how do you take this forward in your lives now? Um, these are just some suggestions that we've got, um, how you could network and educate yourself further. So uh, we just put some links up here that you can look at to um, give you more information. Uh, Permaculture Global is this wonderful site. It's, it's been around almost 10 years now. And it's, it's the Facebook of permaculturists. So if you want to meet other permies in your backyard, you go onto the site. It's got a, a nice Google Earth map. And you can zoom into any area. You can find individuals. You can also find projects. And you can also register your own profile there. Then I found the, the British Permaculture Association has got a wealth of information. 
training courses. It also defines permaculture. It's got the only website so far found with um, a small body of knowledge content. Um, then this is an interesting type of uh, site to look out for, We the Trees. This is a crowdfunding uh, opportunity. If you're looking for funding for your project, have a look at how people have pitched their, their funding here. They basically put together a two or three minute um, clip of what, what they need the funding for and their particular project. And then you can see whether they've been funded and, and how they've gone about uh, implementing their project. And then these last two, Gaia Education and Gaia University, um, they had the, the same founder members um, in the early days, and then they went their separate ways. And I'm involved with Gaia Education. I teach online for them. Um, and we, we focus more on the mass market, short courses, Whereas Gaia University is more individual uh, teaching and uh, specializing in masters, good undergraduate courses in sustainability, but also masters uh, courses all about um, basically the permaculture ethics and permaculture design and eco-village design and sustainability. So the one is more suited for further university type learning whereas Guy Education is more for the mass market and short courses. But both are, are very, very good and teach uh, cutting-edge ideas about sustainability. So that's networking and education. And then the last slide. If, if you had to get going with some ideas, and we're going to ask you what are your ideas after this, but um, here are some hints or suggestions um, we have for... Um, setting up your, your first permaculture garden. Make sure that you mulch. Mulching is very critical because you can see the mulch, all the straw that's lying around, it uh, keeps the moisture in the soil. So it doesn't allow the soil to get frazzled by this harsh sunlight. Keeps the moisture in and continually builds the humus in the soil. It, it provides food and habitat for all the, for the microorganisms then we strongly encourage composting. And then mycelium, you must get your mycelium in your soil. The mycelium is what uh, does break down. And if they have any woody substance, that, that, that's what attracts the mycelium. And then start an organic seed exchange. When you visit your friends, you always bring along your seeds that you have from your garden and you share each other's seeds. In this way, you strengthen the, the diversity of your, your seed network. Planting diversity is also critical. Just look at this picture and look at the diversity in here. We have shallots on the edges to put off all the, the insects that would otherwise come into this little piece here to eat the, the nice little vegetables. Um, we have marigold flowers um, they strangle the nematodes in the soil. They're also a bit of a nitrogen fixing uh, plant. Um, this plant here in the backdrop with these big leaves, this is comfrey. This is a, an accumulator. So it accumulates a lot of nutrients and releases them to be available in the garden. This is a swale in the backdrop with vetiver grass. It's providing a nice microclimate and there's a banana uh, plant right there in the middle. And so here we have rainwater harvesting. Is cycling your kitchen water and your bath water is the easiest thing to do. You can put it through a sand filter. And then more important, most importantly, is form a little permaculture guild where you meet your fellow permaculturists for a cup of tea or coffee and you share seeds, you share your stories, and, um, and you exchange your knowledge. You know, there's no copyright in permaculture. There's a uh, copy left, which is um, free copying. You share your knowledge because uh, one of the permaculture ethics is fair share, which is um, giving out your knowledge and experience. So uh, we'd like to hear from you. Having seen some of this material, um, 
what would you what stood out for you perhaps as something important that you hadn't um, realized before about permaculture and maybe the second question is um are you frozen there um how are you going to apply it? so I'll, I'll stop sharing it the stage um, okay uh well, i think we got a bit frozen there but um seems like everything is going again flowing um maybe uh you um want to share i know what um you what stood out for you and what you will implement in your permaculture project if you would like to go first um i love seeing the the different stages of how big one can go you know like the eco village to the big plot um that's beautiful to see and the way it's done you know on the computer because i've just been doodling with cookies and, <laughs> and pens on paper um but there's probably um like i don't know how how do you do it online how do you do it digitally um it looks really professional i, I can maybe answer that for you it, I don't do it well at all. It's a lot of, uh, it, it's, a, it's a pain in the ass. Let me yeah. say. <laughs> so what, what I've tended to do, because I'm pretty good with PowerPoint, um, once I've got the backdrop, like a, a Google Earth image with contours, mm -hmm. or even that uh, gray map of the Eco Village, which was this huge piece of paper, I managed to get it electronically. And then your PowerPoint slide is normally an A4, but uh, I change that to a poster size. And then I import as the backdrop, I import the, the base map image, and then I make it fit that whole A1 or A, A0 size. Okay. And then on that, I doodle with, the, um, with PowerPoint. You know, you can create circles and whatever. Yes. Alternatively, what you do, you can you can print that out, and and then you use butcher paper or very thin thin tracing paper. So don't use the gateway paper. That's about, I think it's 120 grams. You have to go for the very very light. That's why it's called butcher paper. The butchers used to use it to to cling wrap um, the meat in that, not the brown one, but the, that that uh, transparent paper, and. The, I think that is about, it's either 60 or 84 gram paper. So you use that as an overlay and that you go mad with your cookies, your colors, your expressions and everything. And you can use multiple layers until you get it right. Um, and that, that can be your, your interim design. Um, I think we've lost now. <laughs> I think we did lose now. Yeah. Well, um, maybe she will join us again. Yeah. Um, but thank you, Ezio, for that lovely answer. Okay. <laughs> Philip, um, would you like to tell us what stood out for you and what are you? What, what will you be able to implement um, with what you've learned today? Yes. Um, I also like that the phase, the concept phase, and how you. Uh, implemented that into permaculture but from your background as a, I think builder if I was uh, uh, like project, from that building. yeah as a project manager yeah project, yeah project manager okay and yeah so I also really liked your in, in, in what's it called like how the images look or like the how you presented them I, I took like screenshots because I want to mm. go also more in details and like get inspiration and how you did it PowerPoint and to the content, what you said, what you shared is like really beautiful of the different sizes, scales, and how they have very much in common, but 
approach just goes a bit deeper in certain ways or like there, there are more um yeah the approaches are different like in in the in, in your mom's garden you can start straight away no much not much planning and you can always change things as you go but then with a homestead you already have to think more before you start and yeah. with a eco village even more so it's like that yeah and it's just for me interesting because i'm not very experienced as such um i haven't had land to work on many times i have actually just now this first time and at the same time with a little baby which took most of the time so i couldn't actually focus on it also but it was a very small scale mm. similar size to your mom's garden and yeah it was beautiful to just get started straight away and now i find myself almost at the eco village side which is like a huge mm. step and if I feel overwhelmed and it helped me a lot now yeah. to see how you can have a good overview of a big piece of land just by having Google Maps screenshots or like um, yeah the map and then coloring coloring the area like you don't have to go into detail more than what you did and it just showed me that it's not that different actually mm. <laughs> you just have actually have more possibilities because the canvas is bigger instead of just drawing on a4 you draw on a1 or a0 um, yeah whatever yeah yeah um but yeah very beautiful presentation i really enjoyed it all um it's it's late in the evening for me i'm very tired but i could really follow and it wasn't it wasn't too much as i expected it maybe to make might be also i didn't hear many repetition in terms of just copy, I could really see how it was your experience and not just copy what you write in a book. Like you have the practice element that you do mm. what the theory is. So it's like it has your imprint. Very beautiful. Yeah. No, thanks Thank for you very much. Um, yeah. I, 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 I pride myself on my design approaches, but um, it took me 10 years to realize yeah. that I've got something to teach now because I'm, I'm confident. Um, whereas a lot of my fellow permaculturists, they, they started teaching pretty soon, but they didn't have the design right. experience, the design examples to, to, to share with. Uh, so I think my, my forte is my, my project management background that I've filtered into this uh, permaculture design process that you can apply on a small scale or on a large scale. You just stretch the canvas, so, yeah. Yes. <laughs> But maybe your next step is, have you done a permaculture design course? No. Yeah, that would be definitely something. Yeah. yeah. Whereabouts uh, are you? Where, where do you stay? Um, in Plet, at the, in the garden route. It's a beautiful area. Yeah. And we are um, looking like my wife's ha grandfather owns a, a farm in the Langkloof. Mm. which is probably halfway from plate to the Honeyville, like Jeffrey's Bay, actually close to Honeyville, very close, yeah. Do you know, do you know Honeyville then? Eh? I have heard of it through yeah. people from Cape Town who are also intending to create, start a community and they, yeah, I just yeah, heard of it that it, it exists, but I don't know much about it or, yeah. yeah. Shame. I know John Barrett very well, and he's looking for people to buy. And he's on the because of this whole COVID lockdown, yeah. you know, the sales have uh, not materialized, and it's been very awkward. And um, okay. so he's trying to reinvent the farm. And one of his okay. options is just opening it up to like-minded people to say, "Just come stay there and experience yeah. it. Start setting things up. Yeah. Arable land is there." and get going even if you stay in a yurt or a caravan you know yeah uh, but he still has to um, uh, consolidate his ideas but if you're in the area it's, it's worth going out there and just having yeah. a cup of tea with them and seeing yeah. the loud land and yeah yeah i mean my next step now is to see my family because i grew up in switzerland and so I will we have a flight beginning of August and you will stay until mid October. Mm. Unfortunate timing because it's now springtime. I would love to be here instead mm. of going into winter. But anyway, it just happened with lock 
lockdown that the whole trip was postponed and we would love to see them and yeah my son hasn't never been there so but as you come back from there mid-october um i'll definitely look into that maybe get in touch with him now already and so that yeah. he knows i was interested and i would yeah and then we are like we're playing with the idea or actually yeah it's getting there we don't want to think or think it but creating like a learning clan sort of festival but more a bit more to permanent way because we have a land that is family owned which mm -hmm. means we could actually like if it we could stay there as long as it feels right and um, mm -hmm. yeah and to just let it instead of actually the opposite almost of designing it let it happen as it goes in a rather, okay. rather big scale yeah organically yeah. Yeah. yes and then yeah as you start i'm currently also busy building a yurt mm -hmm. so that we have like the more flexibility of traveling so i would be yeah setting up the yurt there but i could also maybe first for a few months also stay in honeywell maybe if that opens up yeah and just to get the practice or like a, a bit the next step it's almost too far for that like that yeah i need something in between so yeah. <laughs> they might be visiting us uh, when they come to switzerland um because uh, it's quite close yeah. to where we are yeah, and we we will gladly or we would love to meet you and alessandra and your baby and uh, we also have a yes. camper van so um yeah we could go camping so, yes. And Nell joined us again. Welcome back, Nell. <laughs> My internet dropped. <laughs> That's fine. I, okay. back. <laughs> so I did my permaculture design course in 2017 uh, with Belinda Hope. I don't oh, know. Great. Yes, we know very well in East London. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I, I learned, and I worked on farms after that. I worked for Taya Cooper and yes. um, in Swellendam. I worked uh, there uh, at a small holding. And now I have this opportunity with this piece of land here in Stellenbosch, but it's the most narrow, long plot. Mm. And it's just like, and now they're asking me to design it for them. But I, yeah, I, I just like, and I've never done a community garden because it's going to be a community garden. So it's a bit of a challenge for me mm. um, working with this narrow plot. <laughs> it's like so small mm. and, um, and it's from scratch. You know, I only, I only arrive at, at permaculture gardens where it's already established. Mm. And then I worked and I helped and, you know, but this is completely from scratch. So it's, um, it's nice. Now I'm definitely going to use PowerPoint. <laughs> yeah, I think um, you, you got cut off as I was busy finishing to explain on yes. PowerPoint. You set up the page size on an A0 or A1, okay. and you import, you import the uh, the Google Earth image with contours, and so you've got a, a bigger sheet of paper, well, on your screen to yeah. actually work with. And then PowerPoint has got a lot of uh, lines and, you know, you can, you can use PowerPoint quite effectively. It's not the ideal, you know, the ideal is using some fancy AutoCAD or something, but just to, to put something out that looks fairly half professional is not bad. Eh? Yes, yes. And then, and then you save the file as a PDF and you can email that to anyone and they can print it anywhere. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. But, um, yeah. But, you, you know, beyond this uh, webinar tonight, um, Denise and I, you know, whenever you get a chance, we can uh, tune into your design and, and help you along if you've got any further questions. Eh? I did actually email, email the plot, the, the picture, where a friend of mine has already, like, um, put out the, 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 the kilometers, how, how big the plot is, and just to me to start working and there's a dam at the top a uh, very small slope but then the land's pretty flat mm. and they want to do a community garden um i'm just thinking vertical i'm thinking vertical gardening <laughs> and like 
keyhole beds and I want to get all creative, but the owner, he's thinking like just normal cloth, like, <laughs> you know, because it's community, it's not permaculture, homes, dead style. It's so it's a bit different, I think. Yeah, yeah. but thank you. Um, I'd love any ideas, any input, because <laughs> it's, it's just like my baby now and I'm really... Yeah. Well, De Denise has um, given us the coordinates, so we we'll have a look at it and, and um, maybe get get in touch with you during the course of the week, eh? and we can great. share more ideas. Eh? Yeah, that would be great, Ezra. Thank you so much. Okay. No, it's yeah. a pleasure. Yes, I, I just want to add that um, I've been looking at importing the photo into my tablet, and my tablet has a stylus. So now I import it into an editing app where I can draw on the picture. So I, I'm still uh, experimenting with that, but I do find that um, the tablets have usually got very lovely um, editing where you have a little stylus pen and you can just doodle on the photo. And of course, if you want to change it, just go back or... Yeah. Um, so that is also very nice if you can um, import nice. a photo onto a tablet. And yeah. um, then I also uh, like Philip, uh, we, um, Ezio has got all his designs on his website. I will post the website um, on, the, um, on our chat and Alessandra can just give it to you as well. But on his website, he has the design process. He also has all of the projects has, that he has worked on. But from like a small scale to like a big scale to like a rural development. Um, and you can see all the designs there. It's very inspirational. And also all the links well, well, of... Yes, um, sorry. So I was, I was going to say, I'm, I'm missing a couple of years' designs, but all the ones that were done for my uh, permaculture uh, diploma are all there. And they're, they're quite a variety of, of projects. And um, the new ones that I've done over the last 10 years those eventually will be put on the website as well. I just haven't got around to it. Yeah, he's not very good at updating his website um, and he does not yet believe in his wife's skills. <laughs> but it's okay. <laughs> um, but it's really an amazing website, a, a great resource of um, designs and permaculture knowledge is shared on his website. So, um, yeah, thank you, Etsy, for your lovely presentation to my Dancing Dragon Permaculture Loom Space. <laughs> I really appreciate that. And um, it, do you, did, does anybody else have a question that they want to ask? Mm. No one? Um, I was wondering how you can, sorry. Uh, yeah, you can how you can ahead. add the contours in that like you used yellow, but anyway, like did you draw it by hand? Did you just follow the contour on the map, or is that true? No, no. I found only recently. Um, normally, I, I get them from either the the municipality or I actually pay for it. Uh, I get someone who creates them, like a specialist. But uh, about a year ago, I found this website that uh, you just put in your the framework of the 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 square of of where you want the contours from anywhere in the world and uh, whatever heights and there's an algorithm that just produces a, a shape file and um, that you can open up in in google earth eh? um, so let, let's see if i can if i can uh, put that in the chat um, i'm going to quickly look up this, this website and give you the um, the web link. Um, yeah, it, it's still like a little bit above my. Uh, it just blew my feed mark plaque <laughs> <laughs> to get the contours in. So I always go to him to help me with contours. But it's really nice to. Um, I like the the traditional sketch where you put color and cokey and crayon and and you you make a nice A three and um, I really enjoy that type of designing. Um, I think we might have missed a nail again, but um, Nell will definitely watch the recording. So um, I can just so, make a note of where so, we are. So this uh, contour map, um, 
I don't know if Philippe has yes. seen it there. Um, yes. I'll, maybe I'll quickly show you how, how it works. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, I've got my Google Earth is opening up in the background. So what I'm going to do now is um, is just share screens with you again. Mm. Can you share the screen? Yeah. Uh, no, not Google Earth. I want to go um, this one. Okay, so here is the website called contourmapcreator.urgr8.ch. It's actually a Swiss uh, website. Yeah, I was wondering. Yeah. yeah. So let's go straight down to, let's see if we can find Honeyville. If, if you've got the contours, I mean the, the coordinates, you just put them straight into here. But I don't, I don't know them offhand. Yes. So uh, what we're going to do, we're going to find this on the map. Uh, Jeffrey's Bay. There's Humansdorp in the middle. Wow, you found it. <laughs> is this a D? I think so. I know it's got the big mountain uh, in the background. I think that's it. Um, I, know, I know it's right next to these. Um, it's here. This is it here. Okay. So Honeyville is, is this little, this Honeyville there. And there's the arable fields. Do you remember those arable fields? Yes. That you saw in the concept. There they are. Um, okay. So let's get the contours from the site. So all we need to do now, we've got it nicely focused. Um, I just click this uh, northwest corner, and let's just put a, a point here. And then the next point is down there. Okay, so that's my coverage. Maybe a little bit more that way, like that. Um, and I go get data. So now it's it's picked up the the coordinates of the corners. Um, but you can see by default, it's got seven levels of contours but we can customize them now. We've got them in meters, and I want the contour interval, let's just say every two meters. Um, the sampling points, uh, if you want to look at the sampling points, it's, uh, it's on a grid of 20 by 20. There's your 20 by 20 grid. It can't go bigger than that. This, the logarithms can't handle more than that. And I must say it's not 100% accurate um, because of the spacing of the logarithms, but for a desk, desktop application, it's more than enough. Mm. So now we redraw the contours. Okay, there's the contours. And now we need to download them. So you go down here, there they are and you download them as either a SVG file or a, a KML. We'll download them as a KML file. So there they are. I've already opened up Google Earth. So all I need to do is to double click on this, um, on the site. Uh, you actually not seen this happen, but it's 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 beautiful how it happens. Um, I need to share. Sorry. 
new share and Google Earth. Oh, cool. So we downloaded the file. That's quite close. To the yeah. yeah, it's very close. Well, yeah. And there it is. There. So on Google Earth, um, I opened it uh, twice. So, so there is the contours. You right click it, you go to properties, and you can uh, change the color. You make them like dark yellow, and you can make it a, a very, very thin line. There's, there's your contours. Eh? If yeah, they're too really thin, thin, yeah. If they're too thin, um, you just make them half a millimeter. You know, for a desktop um, concept design, this is adequate. Eh? Yeah. Because if you take the project to detail design, that's when you get an engineering surveyor on the site who's actually going to measure the contours. He's going to measure your swales, make sure they're, they're to the right fall, and, and so forth. Eh? So you can see wow. the, big, the big mountain. This is what catches all the rainwater. And then uh, we would catch the rainwater at, at the key points here, where the slopes change from convex to concave. That's where the water slows down. And that's why this is arable land. That's where the water slows down. And this is the best arable land here. And then next to the stream at the bottom. That's why it's a big nature reserve. There's nothing else to do here except look at the, the view. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It's amazing. I think so, Honeyville Eco Village is the first um is it's the first legal eco village where they actually can sell um homes um and you actually are you will get like a title deed for your, your piece of land. Is that correct? Yeah, you're, you're, that's right, you'll get a freehold title deed um, that also gives you, be, it makes you a member of the body corporate of the farm that entitles you to enjoy this whole conservation area and also share an income from the arable land and all the businesses that are um, working um, that lease the arable land and so forth. Mm. Yes, I think um, it's really definitely an inspiration for people in South Africa. Um, it's like the frontier of eco villages because a lot of people in South Africa, they want to form an eco village, but the legalities of owning your piece of land is not always so easy um, to motivate people to buy into eco villages. So um, I really admire Honeyville for the effort that they have taken to make themselves um, legal, <laughs> as you can say. Yeah. Yeah, now I remember that was why they came up. They were talking about all the yeah, legalities and what you have to go through, what process and the head like that. It was a guerrilla community, they call themselves, from Cape Town. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I just joined the WhatsApp group. And yeah, so they had those some some I think a kind of inspiration but also yeah just to, to show what has to happen to make it legal as you say and to do that whole thing which I'm not at all versatile or interested in to be honest but yeah. it's a very important part as you say to make it official make it for people to be um actually yeah set, feeling safe to commit to it in a way that's it yeah. I think for um, for me, it's like, um, you know, if I want to set up a home, it's not for me, it's for my children. So mm -hmm. um, it is like, what can I leave for my child um, or for my children when um, in the future, you know? So I think that legal aspect is quite essential if you want to buy into an eco village, because um, if you buy into an eco village and it's just yours for, for the moment, and you cannot leave it for your children. Um, it's not so, um, I don't think I can commit so full heartedly. Um, so unfortunately those legalities do come in and 
And eco villages have different concepts. I think in Damanur in Italy, um, I think nobody owns the land and you actually have to put all your assets into one collective. So um, each eco village um, has got their own way of operating so that um, they can find their, their peace in buying into an eco project or eco village. Yeah, I think that there are so many ways, as you say, yeah, that you can adjust to what you what your intention is. I mean, eco village is also a big word as community is, um, which is com combines the ecological mindset of sustainability and keeping the earth sacred and and like just going towards that way of living in harmony with nature and eat the ecolo ecological picture by yeah. staying still a village and and having that civilization civil, not just wilderness but also yeah civilization in it living to people yeah yes i really love damanur and tamera tamera is also tamera, a lovely yeah. lovely eco village and oroville i think we all can learn but of course also the transition movement is a lovely movement where um, if you don't want to move to an eco-village, you can join us a town, which is a transition town. And um, I think yeah. in South Africa is great and is South Africa's first transition town movement. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, it's yeah I've been in Elsass once with a project in an eco-village, uh, in a transition town. And yeah, it was with, the project that installed solar panels on school, on the roof of schools with school classes. And yeah, this was beautiful. They had, it was embedded in a whole workshop week and they even transport goods by horse and, and wow. car. Where yeah. is that? Um, what's it called? In the Elsass, in the French part. Elsass. Um, I should actually, what is it called? I will definitely look out for it, um, Elsa's French yeah, I mean, it is, yeah, Italy is, it's, depending, yeah, you're close to Venice, hey? Alessandro mm. told me. Yes, we, we are. We, we're actually closer to um, Trieste um, than, than Venice, so. so we're right in the northeast. So. Okay, now that's love, lovely. And it's very close. To, I mean, I'm from the central part, Zug, at the lake of Zug, Lago. Sugo, I don't know. Mm. Uh, Sugo, okay. uh, anyway, and yeah, it's like halfway up in north, and uh, pretty much the center, basically, like from Switzerland. So it's not mm. too far. And my my parents are also having holiday in August, and they are keen to do like a camping trip to Italy, and maybe you can all together. We will see. Yeah, that would be yeah. nice. Yeah, and also like yeah, Alessandra asked if you know have you heard of Allegria. Alegria. Alegria. Costa, Rica. Is Costa Rica. I think she no, has I, seen or checked out the website. I think it's called Alegria. They have such a cool website. Okay. It's just like explaining the, the village. But their pictures look amazing. Like their sacred geometry in their gardens. And they have this huge, um, like, I guess it's kind of like a geodome. So are you looking wow. at that? Yes. It's in Costa Rica. I think there's a lot of cool eco villages in Costa Rica. Yes, no, definitely. Costa, Costa Rica is, is really switched on. Um, mm. Alexia, Vicarage. Yes, also Portugal, and um, yeah, Portugal is also very into um, eco villages and eco living. Um, in Italy, there's also like a big eco village movement, but we tried to visit them, um, but our camper van couldn't get to these places. They're quite remote. But um, there's like uh, the Elfie and um, the Elfie village, the fairies and the elves eco village, I wish I, lo I would have loved to visit. But I think we just got halfway up the hill, didn't we? And we had yeah, to turn it around. Back, uh, <laughs> so, um, it was, yeah. It was too much. Uh, it was not so easy to visit all these lovely eco villages. Um, and then, of course, um, the language was quite difficult. I find um, Portugal, uh, most people can speak English, 
um, when Italy, it was not the case at all. People here do not speak English. So, um, but you are most likely to find English speaking people in eco villages. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, have you been in Tamera in Portugal? No, um, we've heard a lot about it and we, I had an opportunity years ago to go there, but I, I just never quite got there. Eh? Yeah. Have, have you? Yeah, because I'm very inspired, like by Sepp Holzer, who was yeah. very involved in the designing of Camera and he is an Austrian guy, which, and he yes. did his own way of like, he did permaculture basically at the same time as Bill Mollison and all of that, That's but right. it wasn't yeah. called that way, but now and then, yeah, now he's very, very good with water retaining systems and and yeah, we, we definitely want to visit his um, farm yeah. in Switzerland. We have planned before no, no, this COVID-19 happened. He's in Austria at the Kramito Hall. Yes. Um, yes. Um, we, we've got his videos, which are amazing. Eh? Yes. <laughs> um, and we, we've got to get there soon because apparently he's quite old. He must be close to 80. Eh? Yes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, if you want to meet him. I, I, I sent him an email long ago, but he didn't reply. I think now it's his son also that is more in charge of it. And he is more doing projects all over the globe now. Yeah, yeah. he's involved he's in many got, things. He's also got his young family involved. I think his children are involved as designers and implementers. Yeah. And he's, uh, yeah, his whole greater family. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he must be a good, good, lovely guy. And he's also well, with like water as as an energy form. Like he his whole drinking water system, like the pipes even are like with, uh, like self sustaining. I don't know exactly what it's called, but it's actually an old technique that uses okay, just a constant of flowing of water stream to pump water, so it, it circulates the whole pipe system constantly. So it's also being refreshed more. It's not never stagnant and. It's very interesting what he yeah what he did just by. I think he's also been influenced by um, Victor Schauberger, who is also an Austrian, exactly. who studied yes. the, the energy in water and all exactly. the water seas and it, it's amazing natural natural energy systems. Yeah, yeah. yeah Victor also me. I'm, I'm very very um, what do you call it inspired. I, I love him. I just recently found a very interesting video of a friend of him. I should actually, yeah, you will love it. Do you, uh, do you understand German by any chance? No, no. Okay, but it has English subtitles, but it's so cool if you, if you would speak German because it's like what he says. It's just, it's just so authentic and it's like this, yeah, it's like a, as you, can, you can think of him as a friend of Victor that is inspired by him and he shows the guy his apparatus in his, in his room or like in his um, home. Mm. and explains how it works and it's, it's amazing like he does it it's, it's happening he heats like if 70 watt he has 70 degrees temperature on a, on a heating thing wow. it's and his compost less than basically light bulb without the light wow. so he's, he's using victor's ideas and can, can you send us the the link um yes yeah. We can even see it, I mean, with the subtitles would be fine. Eh? Yes, exactly. Yeah, definitely. Yes, and then I also want to mention um, Biomatrix Water um, is where they restore water bodies to, um, like, especially like Venice and um, all over Italy. The water is quite polluted, but how to put these um, little floating rafts to purify the water? Um, even for South Africa, this, this, this would be such a, an amazing asset. So um, if you've never heard of Biomatrix Water... Yeah, biometric, I haven't heard of that. I just know like the Vortex way of, of basically... Buzzes.com? Oh, I see it works like it. Yeah, I'll, I'll put it here, Dean. Um, okay. So Biometrics Water, um, I'll just share the screen just very, very briefly. Um, this is their website 
and they start off with a with a video. So wherever where there's polluted bodies of water, they put these floating rafts. You see these floating rafts on the edge of the the where the um, the canals in there, and all the wetland plants um, are grown in this um, this raft. Um, and it's the roots, the, the, the long hairy roots that provide all the, the interface for the, um, the microorganisms to grow. Because what cleans and filters uh, dirty water, it's not the plants. The plants only do 5% of the work. 95% of the work is done by the bacteria that hang out on, on the roots. So that, that's a very important concept to grasp. That's why the wetland plants are normally very hairy and provide a lot of root mass so that all the, um, the microorganisms hang out there and they gobble up all the pollution then. So it's quite amazing how just using nature, just in, introducing wetland type floating rafts uh, cleans up all these waterways. Uh, and it also produces a habitat for, for birds and wildlife. And if you've got a floating island in, in the middle, um, it's, it's also predator proof. So the, the ducks can go and lay their eggs, their eggs there and you know, they're safe from, from predators. <laughs> we have the church bells going. <laughs> yeah. Oh. It's yeah. Thank you so much for all your wisdom that you've shared and your time. I I really appreciate it. <laughs> and thank you, um, Philip, for joining us. Um, we did record this, so I hope you don't mind. Um, I will post this um, also on our Loom space for the ladies to um, that did not make it, so they can also um, get some of this wisdom. And of course, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to my husband or I. Um, yeah, you, with, yeah we, we always love to help anything permaculture related. So um, I thank you both for your time. And oh. yes, we will, uh, we will look forward to episode number two. <laughs> yeah, me too. Thank you very much, and okay. yeah, keep in touch. And I found that YouTube video. I sent the link in the chat. Yes, thanks. For, oh, I've, got thank it, you. I've got it open. I'll see it later after supper. Thanks very much. Yes. Yeah. Cool. Wow. Enjoy. And yeah, I'd love to. Yeah, see you maybe online or in or face to face, whatever happens. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Cool. Yeah. Cheers, thank I. you. Bye. Ciao. Bye. <laughs> Let's stop the recording.